Hello everyone, I'm Amanda Kulong and welcome to episode 13 of This Week in Cloud Computing. 13? 13's a lucky number in my is family. It? I don't know why people mine think too. 13 is bad. Yeah, no, 13's a good number. No, it's a really good number. Got a few quick updates for you today. Um, with the This Week in Network, we've got some big news coming early next week that I can't tell you right now, but you will have to pay attention to the website and all of our various shows to get that news as soon as it comes out mm -hmm. early next week. So follow our Twitter accounts also any hints well you're a hint yeah. but I mean we've got you on the show today everyone we have Mark Suster Matt yeah. if, if you were watching the previous show you would know that he hosts this week in venture capital and we've snagged him to join us today for this week in cloud computing so thank you for joining us happy to be here thank you. <laughs> And of course, my co-host, Mark Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Good to be so, here. So, um, other quick news. The analyst firm IDC has reported that server sales related to cloud computing are expected to reach $12.6 billion in the next five years. The report also predicts the private cloud is much more likely to be broadly adopted than the public cloud. Mm. So, there's a link to that report there. It's kind of pricey. It's about $3,500, but if you want to get it, lots of good detail there. But it just kind of touches upon some things we talked about in previous shows yeah. in terms of server sales. Um, thank you to our sponsors. This Week in Cloud Computing is brought to you by Verticor, Storm on Demand, and then Net, D Net DNA. I always want to say that 10 times fast, and I can't. It's hard to say. It, Net DNA, CDN. Net DNA. And please thank them well, on Twitter. On Twitter, Net DNA, yeah. CDN is their Twitter handle, yeah. and Verticor, and also Storm on Demand on Twitter. Yep. So, how can you participate? Well, you can also make sure that you're following us on Twitter. So, TWI Cloud Comp. Yep. And watch this show like you are right now. And you can also listen to us on iTunes and yes, watch us on Boxy and all kinds of things right now. More coming. More yeah, coming. more coming. So, but isn't it true if people are following us and thanking our sponsors, they could win more prizes in the They upcoming. could. We've, we've hinted at some things. We haven't announced anything yet, but uh, just keep keep thanking our sponsors. And you never know when I'm going to give away an iPad. Could they win one of these? This liquidweb.com? Hey. We'll we'll no, talk no, about these, these, guys these are our guys, okay. our special um, guys. They can't have these ones, though. Not allowed yeah. to talk about that just yet. <laughs> and we also so. have Justin.tv for our live stream. We do. Thank you to Justin.tv, so Justin. our live stream, and the, our, the chat room, actually, on our main site right now. So exactly. Thank you. Well, without further ado, we have a few important guests. Yes. You know, obviously we have Suster, so we'll be referring to him as Suster since we have two Marks in the room. I wanted to call them Marky Mark and the Amanda Bunch, but nobody would let me. Oh, <laughs> boy. I got it on. Um, mm, good God. <laughs> I'm the queen of cheese. I know. Cloud. I know. Um, we have Andres Rodriguez, the founder and CEO of NetSuny, who's joining us on the phone. And we also have Kevin Epstein, the VP of Marketing at CloudShare, which will be our app of the week. So there he is. <laughs> Say hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> nice to have you guys both here. And before um, we get started, let's just jump into some news. Story number one. Um, they're in an interview with USA Today's Byron Akuhito. I hope I said your name right, Byron. I'm really sorry <laughs> if I messed it up. Salesforce.com CEO Mark Benioff had this to say about the Google Apps Marketplace. It's kind of like Apple's iPhone App Store, except it's for business software. The idea is that customers can choose from a lot of different vendors and technologies and easily integrate them. That's where the power is. There are a lot of different ways you can integrate these services together. Now, Suster, I have to throw this at you first. Given that you used to work at Salesforce.com, do you agree with Benioff's statement? And is cloud computing going to be more about collaboration and social computing? Let me say the following. First of all, I'm the guy who's on record as saying app is crap. And I'm not a big believer in the app marketplace metaphor. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that it's taken hold these days, particularly because of the iPhone, and now we're seeing it in the iPad. Uh, the problem is, I think it's a horrible way ultimately to discover apps because in a world where we only have a few apps, okay, we can scroll through our pages, but as you have a proliferation of apps and as you have an app marketplace and as we become as broad and diverse as the internet is on mobile devices, it's a horrible way to discover apps. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I really don't like about it is 
it places all the control in the person who controls that chokehold. So Apple gets to decide who actually sees the app. Now, I know we're talking about Google, and I'll get to that in a moment. But let me just give you the obvious is you'll probably have remembered this story about the fam famous political cartoonist. I think he won the Pulitzer Prize. It was the first time that a political cartoonist had ever won the Pulitzer Prize. And Apple decided to ban him from, yeah, I remember this. Yeah. from, from the iPhone, from the App Store. Yeah. It's a great and, story. Yeah, and do we really want to enter a world in which you know there's a dictator who decides what content we should be able to well, see? Well, the Android marketplace has, mm -hmm. has shown that you can have an open or, or a more open marketplace. I wouldn't say it's perfectly open, right. but certainly a lot more open and a lot less constraining than what Apple's done with iTunes. Yeah. I think Google's try and Google's, of course, you know, behind that to a large yeah. degree, and Google's behind this mm -hmm. app market as well. So. I don't know. I would argue that, that that you can you can do you can do a better job of it. Maybe not as perfect as what you're hoping for, but I think you can get closer. I don't understand why there needs to be an artificial world. And I want to just hmm. continue with this analogy, okay? Sure. When you use salesforce.com, they have something called the App Exchange. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes sense there cuz you're not in the App Exchange looking for generic applications. If you're in the App Exchange, you're a salesforce.com user and you're trying to juice up your product to do something that it can't do today. So you might want to add email marketing in and you want to say, "Well, what email marketing solution can I add, but you're not really in the internet. You're in salesforce.com and you're trying to juice the application. But the idea that I need app marketplaces for everything is really artificial. So again, let's continue this analogy. Let's call it facebook.com, right? Uh, Facebook. Well, <laughs> but yes, me, a popular topic. Let let's me go with that. Facebook for a moment and I'll avoid Jason's controversy and we'll uh, kind of just <laughs> focus on this. Everybody these days is creating Facebook fan pages. Do we want to be in a world in which we're creating internet pages and Facebook fan pages mm -hmm. and iPhone app store pages and then Google app store pages and on and on and on? Mm -hmm. I think the beauty of the internet is the decentralization of it and the ability to create once and people discover and you consume. Now, I understand that Google has a vested interest in the outcome here because sure. Right. The way that you discover information in a non-app marketplace world is through search, and guess who controls search, <laughs> sure, right? Of course. So I get that they have a dog in the fight. I just, I don't believe it's the long-run metaphor for discovery. I really don't. Interesting. But I think, I think what, um, what Google's App Store is also trying to do is take advantage of the fact that, or try to get people to use um, Google services bundled with the various apps, so like single login for all these things, et yeah. cetera. And you know, sort of tie them together at the hip, so that it's it's a lot more like what Salesforce is doing, sure. but with sort of generalized services. So yeah, so to that extent, I have to say, I think that makes sense to me. So if you are a Google app user, and let's define it what it is: calendar, yes. email, yeah. <laughs> and you've decided to you know chuck Outlook and Exchange out the door and use this. Yeah, it's nice to have a little marketplace that kind of wraps around that product. So, so that I get. But if Google goes down the route of saying, well, we're going to have a broad, generalized marketplace, then I'm sort of opposed to it. But around a single product makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good point, sister. Andres, do you have anything to add? Do you agree with Benioff's statement that um, cloud computing is going to be more about collaboration and social computing? You know, it depends. You know, I was going to comment on Mark's uh, Go ahead. comments that really. But now it's we have really, three marks because it's no, Mark Benioff, off Mark Jeffrey, and Mark Suster. I know. We're, we're talking Suster, right? right. <laughs> yeah, Suster. You know, I, I think it depends on not so much the discovery mode because I think that, you know, iTunes is a great example of just being able to discover uh, artists through, you know, a, some kind of social collaboration. And I think that, uh, you know, they'll be able to do that in any of the app stores. I think the experience today is frustrating, but the experience is only going to get better. I think what what is more important is what do these apps try to do with the data when it comes to sharing the data? And I think that's what's important about what Mark is saying is that when, when the applications are around a single framework, like say a Facebook environment or a Salesforce.com environment, then you can define much better how the apps communicate with the API of that environment to exchange data, you know, to have like a contact, uh, you know, address book application that shares data within Facebook. But it's, you know, in a generic way, I agree with him that it's, it's much harder. You know, how, what, what is the thing that's binding the data behind all these apps in the marketplace? And I think that this goes back now to your original question. We are going to see um, a lot of sharing. It's just it's not going to be in the shape that we've been used to seeing it. You know, I think that there's been a lot of sharing around, around basic things like, uh, you know, if you look at Dropbox, that's a great 
data sharing application that uses mm -hmm. the cloud as the intermediate backbone. I think that we are, you know, it, I, I'm curious as to what Mark and, and what Kevin think about what, you know, what happens when you get, you know, people wanting to share their contacts from, say, Facebook to uh, MySpace or the Salesforce contacts, and you want to integrate that with the people that are following you in Facebook. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic. It's one that I deba debated with someone who I can't talk about because he's considering <laughs> building a product in this area. But here's the thing. So we were, so I was debating with someone this idea that Salesforce bought Jigsaw, and the gentleman didn't know Jigsaw, and I was explaining it to him. The beauty of Jigsaw is crowdsourced creation of fresh, relevant information that allows you to discover contact mm -hmm. details, right. address, phone number, title, so on and so forth of individuals. Salesforce bought that company. It was a hated company uh, by the tech elite. It was a loved company by salespeople. Every sure. salesperson yeah. I know. Absolutely. And the interesting part of the model is everybody contributes to it, can use it for free as long as you add value to it. And that's fine because then you get free production Right? Yeah. But anyone who wants to pay for it, who's not going to spend the time consuming it, can pay for it. So you get mm -hmm. free production and, and other people get value and pay for it. It's a brilliant model. Now, uh, to, to the point that, that was raised is we started playing around with the idea of what if I could expose my name and address book? What if I could make everything in my name and address book discoverable so you could discover who my contacts were, but only perhaps if you're in my social graph, right? Right. And you say, gosh, I didn't know you had Amanda's mobile phone number. I'm interested in that. So uh -oh. you ping me. You don't <laughs> I'll automatically I'll get to see it. You don't automatically get to see it, but you ping me, and I can authorize you to see it. So yeah. this world in which you can discover contact information from mm -hmm. other people in your social cloud, yeah. sharing what we've already built is an interesting idea. It is interesting. I like that a lot. We'll have to drag you back on the show, and you can talk more about that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Kevin, do you have any input on this as well? Well, so it's funny. We're coming from a, a slightly different direction. Um, big advocate of sharing and less of an advocate of sharing of information, more sharing of workspace. So from the cloud share perspective, you know, big fan of the idea, obviously, like Dropbox, of putting an environment in the cloud and letting people do something with it. You know, unlike Dropbox, which is just about files, cloud shares, about we call it PC2, right? It's your, your personal compute in the cloud. Um, we give you your own set of computers to play with and to share copies with other people. But it's funny, one of our, our biggest concerns from clients was um, antithetical to the information sharing. They want to share the CPU cycles, they want to share their intellectual work in those computing environments, but not expose the information. So kind of an uh, interesting play on, I want apps in the cloud, but I don't want to share them. <laughs> so, but, but people want, uh, in w the world that you're describing, people want to share compute resources. They don't, because I, I kind of have two models in my head. One is the rack space model that says, I don't want to build the infrastructure myself. They've got it, they'll manage it, whatever, but I want my own dedicated servers. And then there's the more traditional Amazon model, AWS, where people are saying, well, I don't even know what the compute resources is. You, d you define how to, how to uh, kind of store my data and give me access through EC2 to compute power, and you deal with it. Uh, I'm interested in what your approach is and how you think about that topic and what your customers are telling you. So our customers love the uh, lack of commitment, and I hate to put it that way, but the lack of commitment of Amazon, but I think that um, at the, risk, you know, at the risk of representing myself as an ex-geek, and I'll make that claim of X, and you all can debate that, but uh, at the risk of, of saying ex-geek uh, and representing uh, our customer base, um, you know, people, again, don't like sharing resources. If I can have, for the same price and the same lack of commitment, temporary servers already pre-installed with the operating systems I need, with the applications I need, I'm going to take that over Amazon especially if it comes with a rack space like privacy. So uh, again, if, if you give me a choice between committing to a rack space with real hardware or going with an ephemeral virtual machine, perhaps at a better price, I'd probably go with a better price. But if you then said, okay, given that it's virtual, would you commit to Amazon where you're really not sure what the underpinnings are, you're never sure if they're really there for you, or something like a cloud share where it's your computer, your computer, your storage, 
uh, your OS, everything pre-installed. Um, our customers have obviously, obviously chosen to go with the uh, the thing that is guaranteed to be there for them and guaranteed to be theirs. Is there a minimum commitment, minimum period of time? Uh, for our pro users, no. It's a, a free product and uh, therefore zero commitment on anyone's side. Um, the folks who come to CloudShare slash pro, uh, usually individual and small business users, um, sign on, sign off for as little as a minute or as long as you know, months. Uh, um, on the enterprise side, we do a classic bill per month uh, approach and, and again, like Salesforce for that matter, um, discount for a length of time. But it's a, a pretty minimal commitment. Again, we, we actually like Salesforce a lot as a model. Uh, kind of frown on the the cloud computing model that says nickel and dime you to death for every little bit of bandwidth or compute use and are, are big fans of the, and don't shoot me for this, of the application model uh, where you pay for a seat and that seat entitles you to use the apps as much as you want. In our case, use the cloud IT as a service as much as you want. Well, I think we'll move on to story number two. Jeez, I know, my goodness. All right, so we'll do story two, then we should probably <laughs> do a sponsor break. Yeah. yeah, we'll do a sponsor break after. Um, Panasonic has announced that they're jumping into the cloud. So starting this fall, the company is going to be implementing Oracle's cloud computing service across its five um, factory solution plants. And then they're also working on setting up an entire cloud-based system for better collaboration among its, I think, 200,000 employees. Mm. Um, and they're going to be using IBM. It's expected. So with all the talk about the different providers, you know, Google's really trying to go after enterprise. Why do you think they've chosen IBM? Mark, you sir. <laughs> let me <laughs> let me start with the basics. Don't you remember? I, I don't know. Maybe I'll age myself when Nobody I say. Nobody gets fired for buying IBM. That was the saying, right? No one <laughs> ever gets fired for uh, uh, hiring IBM. And yeah. you know, the same was true with my original company. I used to work for what's now Accenture. Um, always wonder why huge corporations would pay three times the price you'd have to pay for anyone else. Um, listen, when you're you're talking at scale, you mentioned 220,000 employees. 200, up around 200,000 employees. So let's not compare Google. Right. Google does not know how to serve the enterprise. They don't. Full stop. There's no customer support. There's no uh, in, you know installation. There's no SI capability. There's no mentality. They make all their profits from search. Yeah. And therefore, there's no even mentality about, I'm going to make commitments to you and keep those commitments from Google. Phenomenal company, not an enterprise company, and a long way from becoming one. Uh, so I don't even think they'd be under consideration set. So for me, it would be, would Panasonic for cloud computing choose someone like Amazon? Right. Um, but Amazon is very much a warehouse. Yeah, again, the wrong culture. Yeah, it's yeah. a, well, it, it may be the right culture if you want to do it all yourself. Right. But it's a warehouse. It's stack right. them high, sell them cheap, yeah. and that's the beauty of Amazon. That's why a lot of people like them. But I don't think it pretends well to a big global company that wants a high degree of touch points, right? And so I think that's really what IBM provides. They're probably providing system integration. Mm -hmm. They're probably providing a level of service, maybe even customer support. You know, it's a single throat uh, to choke. And uh, it's probably a layer of management services. IBM owns a bunch of network management platform tools. So I don't think there are a million options for someone like Panasonic mm -hmm. in the cloud. It surprises me that IBM didn't move faster to become perceived as the cloud company. It really right. surprises me. And that, I think that's the point, too, that I'm pointing out with this story because we've talked a lot in other shows about IBM and Microsoft yeah. and all these other companies playing catch up. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, I want to jump into this third story quickly before sure. we go to sponsor break, um, because it's to your point here. Um, despite all the buzz around Google Apps specifically, um, there was a report that just came out from Forrester Research, and it said that 81% of enterprises it surveyed are running Microsoft Office 2007. And that's compared to just 4% with Google Apps. Now, that, that point alone isn't surprising. But um, what's more, one-third of respondents are already planning an upgrade to Office 2010. Yeah. One third of respondents. So meanwhile, Google's pushing the message, we're not an office alternative, we're a collaboration tool complement. That's their actual statement. We're not an office alternative, we're a collaboration tool complement. So when you look at, at these sorts of things, pitting one against the other, who's really scared of who here? They're both scared of each other. I mean, I think uh, Google's right. They're not a replacement for Microsoft Office. Right. Uh, Microsoft Word still kicks ass. No, nobody has surpassed that. I won't use it for large doc. I mean, I will use it for large documents. I will not use Google. 
Um, however, when we do show notes, we do them in Google Apps exactly. so that we can share them. But these are tiny. These are like a couple pages kind of things. Yeah. Um, the, the collaboration is more important than actual document, you know, the full suite of, of features that's in Microsoft Word. So for your book, you're using Word. You betcha. Yeah, we never <laughs> do that. I actually tried to do it in Google Docs at one point just to see, and it just it basically just died. There's, it just I can't handle it. If anybody's a Gmail user, and I suspect all of us are in our personal lives, yep. of which I'm one, this last week will tell you why they're at 4% market share. The service has been down a lot. A lot. And email delivery yeah. has been coming in really slowly. Now I know at the end of the day, a lot of times when you have exchange, you're relying on your own IT department and often you know services go down or whatever. <laughs> Google is not geared up to serve enterprise. They don't get it. They don't understand how to service big companies. They may one day. Salesforce.com knows how to do that, right? So they understand how to sell, how to service, how to support. Google doesn't get it. And uh, you know, when when I look at how they do product releases, when I look at, I mean, even the Nexus, they launch it with almost no thought about how yeah, they're going to support yeah. the damn product. Yeah. It's not in the mindset. It's an engineering company who, you know, I, I have a saying I like to say, which is in a strong winds, even turkeys can fly. Right? So when you are mm. so successful at your core product, arguably the most successful business and product in the history, maybe, in, in a short period of time, then you get forgiven for the fact that you produce a lot of stuff that's not quite as good yeah. um, and that you're not quite as dedicated on. And the reason I point this out is, I don't know if you guys remember the peanut butter manifesto. Do you remember the peanut yes. butter manifesto? the Yahoo thing. Yeah, yeah. so it was, I think it was Brad Garlinghouse wrote this memo called the peanut butter manifesto, which was, you know, at Yahoo, we don't do anything very well. We kind of spread our peanut butter across, across the bread and we don't specialize in anything. Let's be honest. Google's as peanut butter as Yahoo. They just kicked yeah. Yahoo's ass in search, right? So they're making so much money that no one cares right. that it's peanut butter. So anyway, so to, your, to a long answer to a short question. Are you going to stand up and sing peanut butter and jelly for us too, sir? I, I, will not, I will not sing on this show. <laughs> He's singing later. I do want to say to you, because I think it all points to the fact of why people in mass are not giving it up. They're not going to yeah. give up Exchange anytime right. soon or Office products. The biggest threat to Microsoft, frankly, is at the OS level because that device ain't running yeah, Windows, right? My iPad. Right, and, uh, and your iPhone is not running it, and your BlackBerry and mm -hmm. my BlackBerry is not running it, and there's Linux as an alternative. Right. And that's what scares me more about Microsoft than immediately their Office mm. platform. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if I can jump in, I think, sure, of I course. Think to this point and the previous point, in terms of in terms of the, the division between enterprise class and not enterprise class, mm -hmm. you know, I don't agree with Mark that the division is as strong as he points out when it when it's anything below the app layer. And you know, this I know the show is, is concentrates on cloud compute and applications, but really, when you dig deeper, uh, uh, we use Amazon as one of several providers, mm -hmm. and we allow enterprise customers to get on the Amazon cloud for storage or the Iron Mountain cloud for storage or, you know, many other providers. And I can tell you that from the perspective of a customer using it to power the storage services that they have, you know, their NAS boxes mm -hmm. inside the enterprise, they, they couldn't care less. And from our perspective, in terms of monitoring Amazon uptime availability, you know, any kind of integrity problems on the data, they are indistinguishable from the enterprise, so what, from what you've come to, you know, believe are traditional enterprise class uh, storage providers. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, the, the customers see the cloud in our, in our system very much like, you know, I don't care where I'm getting my hard drives from. If it's a hard drive from Hitachi, if it's a hard drive from IBM, it's just a hard drive, it's a commodity thing. And as long as it performs reasonably well, I have a whole system around it that gives me the high availability that mm -hmm. I'm desiring. You know, the SLA is provided by the technology that's wrapping the commodity system of the cloud. And I think that that's, it's very different when you're talking about Google and Google Apps because you're sitting right up against the user. But when you are sitting on top of core infrastructure services like storage, you can add with a software layer something that adds the level of reliability that say, a RAID controller adds on top of a very inexpensive disk drive, and then you don't have to care so much about where the disk drive comes but, from. But I would, I would say to you, I agree with one exception, which is I suspect clients, when they're looking at NAS, except that NAS might be backed up or might be 
uh, supplemented by AWS, uh, by S3 in particular, uh, or by Iron, uh, Iron Mountain. You know, listen, it, but if you were backed up by cockamamie companies that no one had ever heard of, I suspect people would care a lot more. Amazon has earned its chops, I think, with enterprise-grade clients and startup companies that it can provide that service as a commodity. Absolutely, Absolutely. but that's, that is a distinction. Like, like you were saying, it's, you know, Google hasn't been able to do that because they don't do it. Exactly. They mm -hmm. Google they, apps. They don't get but it. Amazon, right, Amazon actually has a reputation that goes beyond being a warehouse provider. I mean, they do deliver the most reliable storage platform out there. You know, or as reliable as the one that I, I can almost bet it'll be more reliable than anything IBM puts out I, there. I agree. They've been doing it for longer. They and, know uh, I think both of you guys are missing the running all day long. Being, being brutal let, and, and blunt. Let me, let me jump in and, gra and grab Kevin here for two seconds. I think you wanted to say something too, Kevin? Sure, sorry. The, the, you know, I was, I, was, I was jumping up and down and screaming here in the background uh, when Mark was, was going on, and I was with you, Anders, up until you supported Mark on the, on the Google Apps question. Um, gentlemen, I think you're both missing the point. You sound like the, the quotes back in uh, the mainframe days about, you know, why does anyone need a PC? These things are less reliable. They're underpowered. That's not the point. The point is that, you know, and, and Anders started to say this, and I was hoping you were going to keep going with this. Um, yes, bandwidth is too low to use cloud beautifully for individuals right now. The apps are a little shaky. Um, it's like the early days in the internet. Yeah, most of those servers are running on people's houses other than the backbone. The point, however, is, is where Anders was going if there were higher bandwidth and the apps were slightly more rigorous, I don't care whether the thing on my screen is coming off my local hard drive or from somewhere out in the cloud. And Kevin, so I think Kevin, that, that transition is what Google's forcing. Kevin, we completely agree on that. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I think Google reputationally has not stepped up to a point where people can trust them to provide enterprise level customer support and service. And once they get trusted and that becomes a commodity, I think you'll see people adopt it in mass in the same way we're talking about S3 because people trust Amazon now. I remember, so I ran two cloud companies. I started my first in 99, my second in 2005. When my guys first said that we were gonna give up our storage and put it on S3, I said, you are smoking dope. I will not do that, right? And we ran pilots and it performed over a nine to 12 month period of time. We had the flexibility and the cost, and frankly, they were as reliable, if not more reliable than us. So we went in mass, and I think the industry trusts now Amazon S3 in mass in a way I'm not sure that they yet trust uh, uh, Google, and I think they do trust Salesforce.com in my experience. Fair, but is it a marketing issue or a technology issue? My view I mean, is it's, I, a, it's, a, it's more than a marketing issue. I think it's a, uh, reliability, uh, a customer support, and a commitment to serving enterprise customers. Mm, I, I go with the commitment, having having personal experience uh, inside and outside of Google. I, I think that, to your point, the mindset is still one of, you know, hey, we're a bunch of folks eating pizza, serving a bunch of folks eating pizza late at night. By the way, I should tell you, my wife worked for Google for two years, so I, I do well, have some closed, inside perspective there. <laughs> Do you agree uh, with the pizza comment? Yeah, pizza <laughs> comment spot on. Perfect. Well, on that note, I believe it's overcast in Santa Monica today. I feel a storm approaching. I feel my do superpowers growing. I do indeed. I hear something. Shield Maiden, thank you so much for telling us about that. Storm on demand. Storm on demand. We got, there we go. All three of us going with our storm guys. Awesome. I'm very happy. Storm on demand is an infrastructure as a service <laughs> cloud computing platform that is powerful, powerful enough to know the dark side of the cloud. No. Powerful enough to replace dedicated servers, a proprietary cloud platform designed by Liquid Web, one of the largest web hosting providers with over, with over 12 years of experience. Uh, it is easier to use and less expensive than Amazon EC2. And features include server setup in minutes, easy scaling, backup and restoration capabilities, and pay-as-you-go utility style billing. Options include cPanel, Fantastico, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, private networking, and much more. Storm on demand. Stormondemand.com. Also now with bare metal servers. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, so instead of purely virtualized servers, you can actually get servers. Remember, I've been, compl I've been complaining about this yeah. on almost every show, that there's one of the things I don't like about cloud computing is I can't see inside the box. I don't know. know what's going on. Boy, so, do we know. And I've used the phrase, I would love to see the bare metal. As of last week, 
Store them on demand. Now, obviously, that, that did work. Them. It's pretty awesome. We love them because they make Mark really, they really do. happy. They do. I admit it. <laughs> and me too. Well, I would like to jump into a conversation with you, Andres, specifically. Um, again, everyone, Andres Rodriguez. He is the founder and CEO of Nasuni. Am I saying that correct, Andres? Perfectly. Nasuni. Now, you're building a gateway to cloud storage for the SMB, at least on a basic level. Um, I wanted to throw in there, you previously founded Archivus, um, which developed an enterprise class cloud storage system that was later acquired by Hitachi, so you had a good exit there. You also served as CTO of the New York Times and worked extensively on digital content preservation for the New York Times.com and Boston.com for their archives. That's pretty cool. That is great. <laughs> and Natsuni was just at Always On for the On Demand conference, and you got quite a few accolades there, and you were named one of the um, 15 cloud companies to watch by Network World, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Great. Yes, thank you. I think we got a few accolades in there. Well, um, I want to start off with um, a definition of NAS because we haven't exactly talked about NAS before yet. on the show. And This Week in Cloud Computing has a range of viewers, and some people know about NAS, some don't. So would you mind starting off with describing a little bit about what NAS means? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. So, it, you know, this is – so NAS is where most of the information in – any company is, which is the file servers. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, this is where your Windows uh, documents are, Windows shares, uh, SharePoint document management, all that typically points to network storage. So and what it is is basically a file system that is available mm -hmm. over the local area network. So it stands for and network attached storage. Have mm -hmm. something like um, Active Directory controlling access uh, to the files. Okay. And so it's a, there's a very easy way for IT administrators to map access to file okay. um, in the different systems. You know, one, what, what I realized when I did Archivist is that there was a lot of, um, there was tremendous potentials to these object stores. That's the generic term of all these cloud storage-like systems, like S3. Um, but most of the data in businesses was stuck in the file servers. And the file servers were typically, you know, using local hard drives and local storage to basically, you know, keep terabytes and terabytes of data, and it grows every year, and the backups are a mess. And I thought, gosh, this really, especially because things like Amazon were coming on the scene, and, you know, like Mark said, is like, yeah. once you've used Amazon S3 for a while, and you realize how good it is, and you realize how inexpensive it is, you just think, okay, how can I use this in more use cases, in more mm -hmm. scenarios? And, you know, the web companies are ideally suited because they use the same API and the same use cases for their data that S3 was built to host. You know, S3 was originally, you know, built around the, the, the needs of Amazon, which is a web company. So any web company can very easily consume something like S3. But traditional businesses, you know, they're using file servers, they're using SharePoint, they're using, you know, Active Directory. It's it's a whole other world and it's been kept apart. So, you know, what we thought with Nasuni is, what we need to do is we need to marry those two technologies. We need to give something to businesses that looks like they're very familiar, they're very easy to use, um, you know, file server, but it, it, it backs right into an Iron Mountain object store, an Amazon object store, uh, right. and, and many others. And, you know, the nice thing about it is that it's actually the two models are heavily, heavily complementary. You know, you, you can have a lot of read writes and saving Word documents as you edit them, and if you're doing it the right way with the cloud back end, you can roll back and see every version of a document that you've edited as different instances of what's stored in the cloud. And that mm. that is a NAS that is very cool, very cool to use. You know, I see Kevin has an iPad, right. you know, it's almost like a it's like an Apple time machine experience with a NAS, which is is totally new to anyone that has been used NAS, you know, in the past. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, and it's especially very cool if, if you can do it, you know, people have been thinking about using the cloud and using Amazon either um, as a web company for primary storage or if they're going to be a business, they definitely think about it as doing backup for NAS or doing right. some kind of archive into the cloud. And we're coming in and we're saying, no, 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 you can use the cloud as primary storage mm -hmm. as long as cache it at the edge for performance and as long as you allow people to override files. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a simple NAS, you know, from, from the business perspective, mm -hmm. uh, then then you benefit from all the stuff that Amazon gives you, which is very low cost, 
uh, you know, multiple geographic locations for storing your data, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, great, great availability. Right. So, why don't you jump a little bit into some points that I think would, would naturally come up with that in terms of disaster recovery, in terms of security? You know, how are you addressing those concerns? Absolutely. So, you know, disaster recovery, the most important thing, and the reason that if you look at the online backup market, Mm -hmm. uh, no one has ever wanted to put more than a few hundred gigabytes in the cloud, you know, in, in, as a remote storage repository, because they're so afraid they'll have to recover the whole thing mm -hmm. to become operational again. And so, you know, one of the things that we had to do is we had to design a file system that when it connects back to the cloud, it can basically run on fumes. You know, we're pulling in a <laughs> very minimum set of metadata from the cloud, a very, very small set of data. The file system can rebuild itself and be operational. The performance is going to be degraded until the cache fills in, mm -hmm. but you'll have something that you can work with. You know, whereas in the traditional right. backup scenario, you would have to bring all the binary in before you can restart the operation. So that's one thing we're trying to address then. And then the other is security. Security, you know, everyone focuses on encryption over the wire mm -hmm. uh, or even encryption at rest. I think you not only have to do that, I, I, you know, we haven't seen a lot of this yet, but I saw, I saw some of this in my previous company. Um, you know, the easiest way to lose massive amounts of data is you're worried about security, you encrypt it, and then you lose or mishandle the keys for encryption. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The encryption algorithms are so good today that if you do that, your data is as good as gone. You're done. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and so, you know, one of the things that we put a lot of work on is using, you know, using one of the big frameworks out there, something like OpenPGP, to basically do not just the encryption workflow, but also the key management part. Mm -hmm. so that you can have partners, you know, in a, in, a, in a great scenario, you can have no keys yourself, you escrow your keys with a trusted provider like Iron Mountain, and you put all your data at Amazon. Mm -hmm. And now no one has access to your data. You know, any employee at Amazon can walk out with a server that had some pieces of your data in it. They're just encrypted blocks. They mean nothing to no one. Mm -hmm. You could have public access to that, that is, there's nothing there. And you know, the keys that are Iron Mountain, like they don't have the data, so they can't look at your data and you can't lose right. it because you don't have neither data nor keys. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting point too, just on a very base level that a lot of companies, they'll upload files or they'll you know, file away stuff and never put the newest version up. If anything's right. changed, it's just, you know, so if they lose that yeah. data, then it's gone. You know, this was one of the big impediments for the object stores. Mm -hmm. in, in, it, it was the fact that that it, it requires complexity to be able to move the data, move the latest versions of the data to the cloud. And you have to constantly think, you know, mm -hmm. is the backup program running? Is the right. tiering program running? And so, you know, when, when instead of that you say, no, no, let's just rethink the file server altogether and just build something that to the applications is indistinguishable from a file server and let that thing cache the cloud. And mm -hmm. that thing do snapshotting to the cloud. Yeah. Then you have a, you have a, you have a much simpler setup. Yeah, I can tell you that when we built Mahalo, or at least the second version of it, mm -hmm. uh, we relocated everything from a um, traditional, uh, I'm not gonna say who it was, but basically a traditional hosting solution that where we rented from them to building our own data center. And we had our own hardware NAS, several of them uh, in the cage. Um, they were paying the ass to set up, <laughs> let's be completely yeah. honest. Um, and then when we wanted to do backups, we, got a, we basically did the same thing at a, at a beta site and sync, continually kept the NASA synchronized between site A and site B. We could have really used something that was in the cloud. We would have definitely loved to have had this back then. Mm -hmm. So I can speak mm -hmm. to that. It's definitely useful to do what this guy's got. Sure. Um, what's the pricing model for Nasuni? You know, we really try to uh, place ourselves as a, as a neutral broker. So we charge for connectivity. We say, you know, it's $3,000 a year. It's a subscription service, and you get one virtual machine, one file server for that amount you can then store as much as you want through us into any of our providers and we just pass through their bill so you know in the amazon case you know it's 15 cents per gigabyte per month mm -hmm. that's what we charge okay. and we've furthermore we've simplified it so that for instance in amazon's case there's bandwidth costs and access per object costs we take all that away we absorb it in our fee because at the end of the day we want the customers to just see a very simple price sheet that says you know, here are the features Amazon offers, and it's 15 cents per gigabyte. Here are the features that Iron Mountain offers, it is, you know, 40, 60 cents per gigabyte. And let the providers, you know, the store, the cloud storage providers, mm -hmm. compete on features and price for customers. Mm 
-hmm. And, you know, in one device, you know, in one of our appliances, you can connect to, you know, you can have a volume in Iron Mountain and another volume in Amazon and decide which data you want where. Um, And, you know, you can keep adding, you know, providers like that. And, you know, one thing we'll do for you is we'll consolidate the bill. So you'll get your $3,000 bill per year per file. And and then you'll get the itemized bill of here's the Iron Mountain chunk, here's the Amazon chunk. You know, we want to make it so that storage is as easy to consume and pay for as your internet connection. That's our goal. Very good. I like very simple, straightforward goals. Always good. I think that one works. <laughs> so in, in other words, your APIs are interfacing with all these different cloud providers. How, how many do you have on board right now? So we have, um, we have now Iron Mountain, we have Amazon, we have Nirvanix, and uh, we have a very, very, coming up very, very soon, as in a week or so, Rackspace. Great. Great. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Uh, no, I think this is a terrific discussion. I mean, I think there's a ton of focus around cloud computing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm, of course, very interested in people uh, shifting some of their attention to cloud storage because I think that's where we've seen a ton of, already a ton of success. I think compute, you know, compute is, is um, compute is very mature on the full application stack when you right. look at things like Salesforce.com and Facebook. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you go one level below that and you're thinking about the, you know, the virtualization of the stack and you know just running like EC2 type compute. I think there's a lot of worries around security in that area yeah. that is holding it back. But when you think about storage, you know, I do think that encryption and the fact that storage is so straightforward lends itself to being, you know, ahead in the adep- in the adoption curve for for a lot of customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, on, on the storage side. So you know, I like to see more discussions about how to use S3 for all kinds of scenarios in, in the enterprise, in businesses, you know, mm-hmm. DR scenarios, you know, this kind of NAS primary storage scenario. You know, I think there's okay. there's a lot out there that's untapped still mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, from services like Amazon. Sure, sure. And just looking at you as the primary storage on demand environment, so looking at what you're doing much more than just secondary storage. That's right, okay. primary, very important. Any, any points from you guys? Anything else you wanna add? No, it's great. Good. Well, thank you so much, Andres. Everyone, Andres Rodriguez, founder and CEO of Nasuni. And I believe we have a musical endeavor we are about to embark on. <laughs> An here interlude, in the perhaps? Studio. Yes, busting out the cloud the cloud axe. The, the, the cloud guitar. The cloud guitar. Right. Suster. Suster, you're going to sing on, with this one? I don't know. Lip sync. <laughs> you cloud hosting provider letting you down. Take a look at managed private cloud solutions from Verticore. Managed cloud private solution can easily replace your current IT infrastructure and eliminate IT pains. Avoid the cost and hassle of buying and maintaining IT equipment and software. Deliver 100% uptime to end users. Configure and deploy computing resources in just minutes. Come on, sister, you know the words. (laughs) With Verticor, oh, Verticor. You should be using Verticor. Verticor, oh, Verticor. Suster should be using Verticor. With Verticor, your private cloud is hosted in an advanced and secure data center, which uses only best in class hardware and software and gives you access to scalable bandwidth. Verticor's team of experts monitor and maintain your private cloud 24 by 7 by 365. With Verticor, oh Verticor, you should be using Verticor. Verticor, oh Verticor, you should be using Verticor. Verticore.com. Verticore.com. Please thank our sponsors and sing to them as well. At Verticore. Always sing. Did you like that, guys? <laughs> well, I believe we have an app of the week. We have, of course, Kevin Epstein, VP of Marketing at CloudShare. Are you still with us, Kevin? I still am. There you boy, are. Music sting. I love it. I should, I should get that <laughs> room. All kinds of great stuff on this week in cloud computing. Come on. 
<laughs> so we've got CloudShare on, and it's a service for demoing software in the cloud. So I'd actually said to Kevin before the show, shouldn't we use CloudShare to, to do demo the, CloudShare? You know, CloudShare, but then it's a demo within a de anyway. Right. So bit meta. Yeah, bit meta. But we like things that are meta. So anyway, I am going to pull up our demo here, but while we do that, I want to throw in some details here on Kevin. So prior to CloudShare, Kevin had similar roles at Scalant Corp and VMware, who also happens to be a CloudShare client now. Hmm. It's always a good sign. That's a good sign. So uh, back in December, the company launched to the public and announced it had raised an additional $10 million in Series B financing. From Sequoia. From Sequoia, Gemini Capital, and Charles River Ventures. So I believe the total funding is $16 million. Is that right, Kevin? That is correct. Great. And funds are being used to accelerate product development, I've been told. Product and development? Of course, marketing. We want our share. Of course. <laughs> of course, marketing. So uh, the platform's integrated with Salesforce.com CRM. You'll be happy to know, Suster. Nice. So, um, and I believe, Kevin, didn't you also go on record at one point saying that you're a huge fan of Salesforce.com or something like that? I might have said that. I believe you did. I did my there, research. There are idols. <laughs> Salesforce and, uh, and uh, uh, Salesforce, VMware, and WebEx. Combine the three of them, and you've got CloudShare. So. All right, I am just pulling up our demo site here. Um, why don't you go into a little bit of a background right now before we get started. Uh, you call, call them your heroes, actually. You said Salesforce.com and Citrix were your heroes. That's what I found. So, Salesforce.com and WebEx. Oh, and WebEx. And WebEx. Yeah. Just to make life a little different, or go to meeting. Choose your, <laughs> choose your uh, uh, PowerPoint showing solution of your choice. All right, so uh, I have to hear about this. Why, does cloud, you, why, do, why do you, as CloudShare, admire these companies and want to emulate them? What's specifically about them? So I'll pick a Salesforce from the um, pricing and ease of use standpoint. And Salesforce took what everyone else would have called a bunch of hosted databases and said, you know what, people, it's not about the hosting, it's about the application on top of them. And we're going to give you an application in the cloud, and you know, before cloud was cloud, right? you had right. Salesforce, back when it was SaaS, not infrastructure as a service. And Salesforce said, we, we won't nickel and dime you to death. We won't charge you per lead. We won't charge you per CPU or per bandwidth. It's per seat model, you know, sign up, we'll charge you a flat fee per seat, and you'll use this wonderful analytic application, oh, that happens to be on a bunch of very cool hosted databases that we put in our own cl private cloud. Right. Mm -hmm. um, love that model. And same thing as CloudShare. Fixed price, no nickel and diming you to death, a per seat model, Everything's included in that per seat, and oh yes, do we run a private compute cloud underneath it? Yes, of course, but that's not the focus. The focus is the application, this ability to very quickly upload and hand out virtual machines, or sets of virtual machines. And, and to that point, there's the WebEx analogy, which is, you know, again, potentially revealing my age. Um, I remember when doing a webinar was not as simple as, uh, as sort of what we're doing right here. Um, used to require a dedicated camera crew coming in, a dedicated encoder box. Anyone else remember this, or am I showing my gray? Uh, I remember it. Yeah. Right. Right. So, I see you, Gray. <laughs> <laughs> and WebEx came along and said, you know what? Let's build something really simple. I was at Real Networks at the time, and we made fun of them, because after all, you know, we did streaming media software. What's this bunch of jokers doing? You know, it's just a web page in front of a bunch of streaming media. And we, we you know, I missed it completely. WebEx was about making it super easy for anyone to point, click, upload a PowerPoint, and share it with other people in a controlled way. So you could always yank back your PowerPoint and you could have analytics on who saw it and how many times they watched your webinar and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so CloudShare said, well, gosh, this whole cloud thing, what if you could make it as easy as WebEx with PowerPoint to do that with IT infrastructure? Mm -hmm. So what if literally I have my six servers here and I want to do a Star Trek moment and say, you know, Mark, Amanda, I want to teleport a copy of my six servers over to your place so that you folks can run your data through them and try out the software I've installed. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't that be as easy as WebEx? After oh, all, we have like bandwidth. That. We have cloud, we have bandwidth. What, you know, what's so darn hard about getting IT into the cloud that companies like Amazon will charge you $100 per virtual machine that you have to FedEx to them on a hard drive hmm. to get it into their cloud. Right. Fair point. That's true. And, it's just, and, and, and to, to pick on my alma mater, VMware, slightly, 
um, at the time that I left, and, and they have improved, uh, not a current fault, but a, a, you know, many years past, uh, leader in virtualization, when we shared virtual machines with our different sales engineers, we did it by burning them to a hard drive and FedExing them. Wow. Yeah. Leader in virtualization is using FedEx as their primary transport mechanism. <laughs> it's like going to AOL not being able to get online. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, yeah. We're still yeah, having such a thing happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, this seems to be a, a boon, obviously, for you know smaller companies because enterprises can do this sort of thing. But to be able to have a smaller company give potential customers a software demo in a virtual network environment, you know, you didn't really have that before. Yep. And I mean, in fact, the irony is that we've we've ended up with two large customer groups uh, on the high end. Believe it or not. We have Cisco, VMware, SAP, mm -hmm. WebSense, uh, Alcatel, Lucent, a couple handfuls of other very, very large companies using CloudShare for the analytics on the back end because mm -hmm. they want to know where their demos are going, where their sales force is uh, introduced to people. They want to support their channel. Um, and frankly, they're starting to use it just for straight outsourced IT for non-essential functions. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, to your point, we have literally thousands of users using CloudShare Pro, which is the, the free application. Um, not so many analytics, but just as simple a, a front end to get into the cloud. We, mm. we restrict you to six servers or personal computers. Um, okay. But we've got you know, several thousand individual and small businesses using that because again, to your point, whether it's a, an IT application where gosh, there's someone in a remote office and I just don't feel like going out there and setting up servers for them, or a simple test situation where I'm a reseller, I'd love to show you the latest Microsoft Office SharePoint, but I really don't want to waste half a day coming out and trying to set it up on your site. Uh, CloudShare is a great app. and we, we, we internally like to say that CloudShare um, lets IT people go back to their real value added job as being IT people versus mm -hmm. what we become, which is cable monkeys. Sure. No one wants to be a cable monkey. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so you're essentially offering sales execs a free IT lab right now. Um, how, how long are you going to offer the free version? Um, so we're not Google. We can't do it for 10 years. <laughs> but uh, it, we, we, we are committing to our customers that there will always be some variant of a free version. Sure. Uh, we do want to introduce um, some sort of pricing around the low end as well as the high end. But... Uh, you know, we see, see no reason in the immediate future to pursue that aggressively. We're right. happy to have people using the, the free version uh, because it's kind of like the early days of virtualization where you try and explain what is a virtual machine and people kind of look at you sideways and say, Java? Uh, <laughs> you know, we try and explain, well, this is, it's kind of like infrastructure as a service, only it's more like IT as a service because you move in everything at the same time, including the operating system, and it only takes five minutes and, and people's eyes start crossing. Mm -hmm. and it's much simpler to just say, look, go to cloudshare.com slash pro. It's free. Try it. Five minutes later, you'll get it. And people do. Excellent. <laughs> well, do you want to give us a quick demo, or should I just pull up the site here? What would you like to do? Um, I'm happy to do a demo. What's the easiest okay. way? Can you well, guys, I, uh... we're, in the, we're waiting for the organizer to join. Um, hmm. So we're, we're in GoToMeeting right now. Um, and if... Me... If we can do it that way, otherwise we can just pull up the site over here and take a quick peek. I will use GoToMeeting because, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. it's uh, a lot easier to um, to demonstrate something within another window versus using some sort of uh, recursive uh, uh, you know, window, <laughs> window within a window. Um, to your point, one of the nice things about CloudShare is not only can I hand out the servers, but uh, to use my earlier analogy about uh, teleporting a rack, um, it's like teleporting a rack with a, uh, uh, you know, with a video camera attached. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the good news is that uh, we can not only share servers, but we can screen share within those servers. Um, so I can hand you a copy. I can hand Mark a copy. I can keep the copy. And if any right. of you run into trouble, I can go peek in on what you're doing and help you out. Mm -hmm. So here's uh, CloudShare Pro. Okay. We're going to look at the... Uh, Actually, you know what? I'll go, go to, to your the, screen, Amanda. Yeah, I'm waiting for, um, we need your screen to come up. Oh, I believe this is where it says, that, waiting to view Kevin's screen. Yep, I see uh, I see Amanda there, and uh, let's see if we can actually persuade this to start. Uh, technical difficulties, always awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, and the good news or bad news is this one is uh, not on CloudShare's end. This is a, a uh, classic uh, 
Well, you we want to do this? You want me to do the glitch? Yeah. We can do the commercial, and then we can let well, you guys sure, try this Sure, why don't you oh, work that out, Kevin? And in between, we we are hearing something here in the studio. I'm going to storm. I'm feeling a storm. I feel I'm hearing it. I am. Stormy in here. That's right. Get your little guy going, Mark. Come on, it's part of the shake. There we go. Awesome. Uh, my game kills yours. Anyway, man. storm on demand. Storm on demand. It's an infrastructure as a service cloud computing platform that is powerful enough to replace dedicated servers, but still not my iPad. Maybe my iPad. Uh, it is easier to use and less expensive than Amazon EC2. It's a proprietary cloud platform designed by Liquid Web, one of the largest web hosting providers with over 12 years of experience. Uh, features include server setup in minutes, easy scaling, cool little guys with giant biceps, uh, easy scaling, backup restoration, uh, pay-as-you-go utility-style billing. Options include cPanel, Fantastico, Amanda working little guy in front of my head. I don't know what she's doing, but I'm scared. Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, private networking, and much more. Storm, storm on demand, stormondemand.com. Please thank at Storm On Demand. Thank you. And yes. Okay. How are we doing? Well, we are loaded up. Um, Kevin, is is your screen ready yet? Yep. And uh, I'm going to try and hit go on this, and let's okay. see what happens. We'll see I what happens. Restarted the go to meeting, and you yep. know what? I hate to say it, I should be using WebEx <laughs> 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 because the go to meeting is refusing to show. But you know what? I don't know if you folks uh, do. You have the Skype video up? I can try sharing uh, screen via Skype video. That probably that won't work with our setup, to be honest with you. Oh. Yeah, well, no, you know what? there you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at oh, that. Wait, there we it can is. see it. Never mind. I'm wrong. Wow. So, so uh, <laughs> you know, talk about recursive. Um, hopefully, what you're going to see now, let's see. There we go. Perfect. Next look is, uh, is uh, CloudShare Pro. So let me actually show you how easy it is. Let me start by logging in uh, to sign up on our site. It, we just require the, the classic email and password. And um, I'm going to, in live time, and I hope you folks are seeing this. Yeah, we can see create, it fine. No, let's create a new uh, server environment. So this is exactly what you'd see coming in. I click Create a New Environment, and look, there are a bunch of servers. Um, I'm going to show off uh, Office 2007 Pro. Um, let's, uh, you'll notice we've got Windows 7. Why not? Let's pick some Windows 7. We could do SharePoint or Active Directory. Again, super simple. Um, we have Linux as well as Windows, obviously. I could use the fast upload button and in 15 minutes upload machines that were local on my desktop. I'm going to skip that. I can type in descriptions, continue, finish and run. And uh, we're actually going to use a Julia Child moment here because this uh, environment creation probably will take two minutes. And so in the interest of sparing our audience, we'll <laughs> go to one that's already running. But here we have a bunch of machines. And if I choose view machine, as you can see, just logs in. And I'm, I could do this full screen. I could do this, uh, you know, so it occupied my entire desktop. Wow. But here I am, uh, you know, welcome to, let's see, XP Professional with Office 2010. I now have my own computer in the cloud. That fast. By the way, that computer in the cloud, not only does it have its own local storage in the cloud, but I can connect it to my local desktop here on the computer that I've logged in from. This is a little recursive here, to your point, getting a little meta. But what you're seeing now is we're screen sharing. I'm logged in on my physical computer locally. It could be an iPad. It happens to be an XP machine. I'm using Windows XP. In my window, I see another Windows XP machine in the cloud. That's cool. And yeah. in it, I've logged into my local disk on my local machine, and I can drag and drop files into the machine in the cloud. Wow. Yeah. Did I do that fast enough? Wow. <laughs> Well, you, you got a lot of that's cools over here. I, I believe I heard them in the studio. From hey, let's try Microsoft Word 2010. Whoop, I haven't licensed it. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. So I am um, and. Uh, woo. <laughs> hello, hello. And you can see how easy this is. Yeah, it just seems like there wouldn't be much of a learning curve no, it, it, at all. Because this is our point. When, when, yeah. when those of us who are involved in cloud share heard the word cloud, we all had this vision of, wow, that'd be so great. There are these machines out there, and you can just use them as an extension mm -hmm. of your machine here. Wow. And then we all tried signing on to the various cloud providers and listened to the ads and bought into the, the hype. And it turned out it always took us hours to days to weeks mm -hmm. to kind of 
get machines there and get our accounts, and, and that was bad. <laughs> I can see why. So, you know, we, we built it, again, WebEx and Salesforce.com are our heroes. Let's build it as a service. Let's make it all inclusive, like Salesforce.com. So when we charge enterprises for this, we just charge per seat per user. Okay. That includes all the virtual machines, all the bandwidth, all the operating system licenses, all the ancil ancillary applications like SQL Server, everything. Mm -hmm. And right. then let's make it that simple for the enterprise IT people who you know, tend to be a little bit of a control freak. Let's put a back end on it that looks like this. Mm -hmm. So here's your very Salesforce looking back end okay. where I can track who's doing what with the system. And you know, as the evil controller, I can stop people from doing things. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna do that. You know. And on the front end, uh, as, we, as we demonstrated, and I'll go back to where we set it up, see how long that took, there's the original environment I started. Wow. Mm. It's that fast and that simple. Oh, and there's another kind of cute aspect to this which is, uh, if I get out of the environment back into the home page, again, we built this originally as a way of doing sales demos, although it's now being used more and more by training groups, by IT groups. Mm -hmm. So if you guys like this environment, oh, look, here's the little three machine environment. Let's give Amanda Kulong a copy. Amanda, what's your email? Amanda at thisweekend.com. So I'm going to send you an invitation. And everyone, and, I will let you know how that goes. Yeah. Viral time. Or you can find out directly if you email Amanda this weekend. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so Amanda, you just got your own copy of these three machines. Excellent. Wow. And, Actually. And you click on, on the link that you'll have in your email. You'll have these three. They're all full functioning machines. It's all yep. free. Uh, and I right now have a tether. So I can see what you're doing when you choose to use the machines. No surfing that site. Um, if you choose, and again, I've set permissions so that you can cut that tether. When you log in, there'll be a button over here on the upper right mm -hmm. that says take ownership. And you can snip that tether, and then you've got your own environment that you Perfect. can make changes to and go send to other people. Perfect. Well, Kevin, so, I need to uh, wrap you up here. Wrap it up. Um, but great demo. I mean, if anyone wants to check it out, go look at cloudshare.com. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously. fantastic demo. That was really great. I mean, any any final thoughts, Mark? I think it's Suster. I think it's very cool. <laughs> I love the idea of being able to share instances of compute resource in the cloud. I need to go through my head and think of all the the use cases, but the idea that you could log on there and use applications right. that you don't have natively on your computer is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, our that. goal was to make this to your to the to the start of the show, guys, when we started talking about Google and collaboration. Right. Let's make it as collaborative as Google, yep. but let's make it as familiar as your own local Macintosh or PC. Well, right. Kevin, Andres just said he's going to sign up too, so you already have oh, Sunny coming on board. Excellent. <laughs> All right, well guys, I need to wrap things up here, but thank you so much. That was a great demo, Kevin. Ken Epstein, VP of Marketing at CloudShare. You can follow them on Twitter, CloudShare IT. And also, Andres Rodriguez, founder and CEO of Nasuni at Nasuni on Twitter. Thank you so much for joining us as well. And of course, Mark Suster, my Marks, in the studio today, and Mark Jeffrey. Mark squared, yes. Mark squared. Mark squared. And sponsors, one more time. Yes, we Verticor, have Verticor, Storm, Storm on Demand, Demand NetDNA, Net DNA. and it's NetDNA CDN on Twitter. Twitter. So, show would not be happening without them. We love them, they make this possible. Awesome. And if you have ideas for this show, send them to pitch at thisweekend.com, or you just found out my email address is amanda at thisweekend.com. <laughs> And you know, again, any any trade shows, any award submissions, things like that that we can share with our audience, send those all to pitch at thisweekend.com. But till then, next week, new time, 3.30. Great yes. for everyone who joined us here. Next week, new cloud time, same cloud channel. I am Amanda Kulong. This is This Week in Cloud Computing.